All right. Uh, uh, good evening and uh, greetings and blessings of the Buddha, Dhamma, and the Sangha uh, to all of you. We are going to begin our bi weekly sutra discussion. Um, and we are very fortunate to have uh, venerable monks and nuns joining from different cities. And uh, we are still expecting uh, Bhante Bodhi. Uh, he said he would be here, um, but we are <laughs> waiting for him. Uh, so until he comes, uh, we can begin our session uh, by paying respect and homage to the Buddha. Uh, let us recite Namo Tassa three times together. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahamma Namo Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa I pay my respect and homage to him, the Blessed One, the Worthy One, the Fully Enlightened Buddha. Oh, here you go. Bhante Bodhi is here. <laughs> <clears throat> so, uh, dear friends in Dhamma, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, introduce our venerable uh, monks and nuns who are joining today's bi weekly sutra discussion uh, from different cities. Um, uh, we have uh, our beloved uh, Dhamma friend, teacher, uh, the most venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi, uh, joining us from his uh, beautiful uh, monastery in uh, New Jersey or New York. <laughs> like uh, I can see the beautiful background, fall background. <laughs> yeah, it's New York, not New Jersey. New York. <laughs> And uh, of course, uh, all of you know who Bhikkhu Bodhi is. Um, and uh, we have uh, Bhante Verapanyo uh, joining us from Washington, D.C. Then we have uh, uh, Venerable uh, uh, Dhammo, uh, together with Bhikkhu Yuta Dhammo, joining us from Stony Creek, Hamilton, uh, Canada. And then we have Bhante Pemaratana joining us from Pittsburgh. Uh, we have uh, Venerable Bhikkhuni Sobhana joining us from the Dhammadhar Monastery in California. We have Bhante Vangsananda joining us from Seattle, uh, USA. We have Bhante Uparatana uh, Naik Mahatero uh, for joining us from Washington, D.C., USA. And then we have Bhante Jinananda joining us from Ottawa, Canada. We have Bhante uh, Surya Ratana, Badule Surya Ratana joining us from Washington, DC. Uh, and we have Bhante Sunita joining us from uh, Ottawa, Canada. We have Bhante Kusala joining us from here, Mississauga, Toronto. And we have Bhante um, Kamala Siri joining us from Minnesota. <laughs> So I would like to welcome all of you to our bi-weekly sutra discussion. And also a warm welcome to uh, our friends who are joining uh, us, watching us on YouTube and Facebook Live. Uh, so I have a kind request to all our friends who are watching us on YouTube and Facebook, if possible, uh, please uh, share um, this program in your social media timeline so that uh, your friends, your devotees, 
uh, and those who follow you also could benefit from today's uh, unique discussion with the venerable monks and nuns. So dear friends, uh, this time we have a unique uh, uh, discussion topic uh, that is uh, Dhamma, humanity and charity, inspiring stories uh, of the greater benefit of the world. And today we are having this uh, unique discussion in, in great support of the, the most venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi's uh, Global Buddhist Relief Program. <laughs> and uh, uh, we uh, simply and uh, lovingly call him Bhante Bodhi. Bhante Bodhi is uh, doing uh, a, a great service to the people around the world. And through his, he founded this uh, movement, uh, Global Buddhist Relief, and he's helping the children, the women, the people who are going through uh, difficulties. And uh, we have been uh, uh, observing his uh, global activities uh, with uh, great uh, inspiration and motivation. So Bhante Bodhi is going to uh, have an animal uh, kind of program, a kind of fundraiser uh, is coming up in October. And, uh, and so uh, we would like to talk about the charity work that we all are doing, especially uh, Bhante Bodhi and what he does. I think uh, we would like to hear about your story, Bhante Bodhi, about the uh, Global Buddhist Relief. And could you please tell us when you founded it and what are the main activities you're doing? Okay, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Yes, Bhante. Are you hearing me okay? Yes, yes, Bhante. Okay, I think the maybe the origins of, Bud of Buddhist Global Relief, it might go back to the end of 2004, when there was a this South Asian tsunami struck, it was the day after Christmas in 2004. Um, and of course, Sri Lanka was one of the countries that was worst affected, as well as Indonesia, Thailand, maybe, maybe some other countries in, in South Asia. But anyway, I was at that time, I was living in another monastery in a monastery in New Jersey. And when I heard about the tsunami striking Sri Lanka, I thought because I lived in Sri Lanka for more than 20 years, that I wanted to do something to help the uh -huh. people who were affected by the tsunami. And so I sent a letter to the people, to the lay supporters of the monastery where I was living, which is called Bodhi Monastery, not named after me. That was just the name in New Jersey. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And I also sent it to Bhante Gunaratana at the Bhavana Society. And he sent my letter to everybody on his mailing list. And then I sent it to a woman that I know at the Insight Meditation Center in New York City. And she sent it to everybody on their mailing list. Uh -huh. And so within about two weeks, we got about $160,000 in donations. Oh, wow. And so th at this time, this was... Buddhist Global Relief did not exist at that time. Uh -huh. But still, we had to decide how we're going to dis distribute these funds that we collected. And at the time, Google had set up a list of organizations that were providing assistance to the countries in South Asia affected by the tsunami. And we were thought we would, we would try to find Buddhist organizations and when we looked at the list, there were many Christian organizations, many, um, some Jewish organizations, Muslim organizations, many non-religious organizations. And I think we could find only two Buddhist organizations. Uh -huh. One is Sarvodaya, of course, which is based in Sri Lanka. And the other is the Tsuji Foundation based in Taiwan, but with branches in other countries. And it struck me as rather disturbing 
that in Buddhism, we speak so often about the benefits of generosity, of compassion, loving kindness, uh -huh. but especially the way Buddhism is practiced here in America, especially by American converts to Buddhism. We love these qualities like metta and karuna, but mainly as meditation practices that we do to elevate the mind. But very seldom do we let transform those qualities into courses of action, whereas it's other religions, particularly the Semitic theistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, which place much more greater, much greater emphasis on charitable activities to uplift those subject to misfortune. And so this was sort of weighing on my mind over a couple of years. So we wound up distributing the money. We, of course, we made donations, I think, to Savodia, maybe to Tsuji, but mainly to organizations like CARE, Direct Relief International, maybe Doctors Without Borders, and some other organizations like that, mainly non-religious organizations. Mm -hmm. But this was weighing on my mind. Then in the year 2007, the North American Buddhist magazine, Buddha Dharma, requested me to write an editorial essay. And so when I was thinking of a topic, I wish to base that essay, the thought occurred to me to express my thoughts about how in Buddhism, you know, we extol these qualities like loving kindness and compassion, mainly as just internal meditative practices, but we don't <clears throat> take a strong initiative in transforming them, expressing them in courses of action. And I felt that in today's world where people are subject to so many types of suffering, not only through natural disasters, but through social oppression, economic injustice, poverty, hunger, and so forth, that it becomes incumbent obligatory for us as Buddhists if we're truly to live up to that, the requirements of loving kindness and compassion, we have to find ways to put them into practice and action. And so I express these thoughts in the essay with no idea at all of forming an organization. But the magazine was published, I believe, a particular issue in the summer of, or maybe the autumn of 2007. And some of my students at the time read the magazine and started discussions amongst themselves about the need to step up to the challenge presented in that essay. And so first they had discussions amongst themselves and then they brought me into the discussions. And so after several rounds of discussions, we decided to form an organization that would put the, we call this putting compassion into action. And initially we set up, we set up as our mission to provide relief to people around the world affected by natural disasters, poverty, social neglect, political oppression and so on. But in a short while, we realized that that was just too general, too broad a, a mission for an organization with about seven or eight people and <laughs> no funding at all at that point. <laughs> <laughs> and so we decided to narrow down the mission by making our focus the problem of chronic hunger and malnutrition around the world. And we started off with a small team of, I said, about eight to 10 people. Fortunately, just at that beginning, when we just were beginning, somehow just through this chance working of karma, we attracted people that I didn't know before, but who had strong backgrounds in relief work and humanitarian service, including mm -hmm. a woman who had formerly been a deputy director of CARE who had retired and then she decided to join us. And another woman in Colorado who had been in the telecommunications industry, but who had a strong inclination to charitable work. And so she left her job with the telecommunications industry and eventually became our executive director. Uh... Uh, that's that's really uh, inspiring uh, story, Bante Bodhi, 
and uh, um, and I would like to kindly request all other uh, venerable monks and nuns, if you have any specific questions to uh, ask Bhante Bodhi. Uh, yeah, but but we haven't even formed our organization yet. <laughs> yeah. So now, now how we can help? I, I'm, yeah. Bhante Bodhi, I know personally, uh, uh, they're, uh, uh, among us, I know uh, all the venerable monks and nuns, they are doing something similar to you. Yeah. Like helping people. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. Our life has been like that throughout. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe yeah. um, in, in why we are doing this, like in maybe uh, some of you can uh, tell your own story, like, uh, and, and also maybe we can ask questions yeah. about the, of course, the, the, there are three key terms we are using Dhamma, yeah. uh, humanity. And the charity. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I, I wanted just to continue, if I may. Yes, Bhante. Because I, I just spoke so far just about, we haven't even yet gotten together to establish mm -hmm. Buddhist Global Relief, but I was just speaking about how people came together at these first meetings. But then we formed the organization with the mission of addressing the problem of chronic hunger and malnutrition. And we started off, a few people made donations so that we started off with a bank account of about $20,000, something like that. And we, I didn't know how to get started. What do we do? But the person who became our executive director suggested, we start with three small pilot projects. And so we started with one project in Sri Lanka in association with Savodia Women's Organization helping poor women start home industries to support their families. Another project was with the Save the Children operating in Myanmar after a cyclone struck Myanmar in 2008. And the third project was providing assistance to provide meals to hospital patients in Vietnam. So we had these three small projects. Then we issued a newsletter in which we and a website in which we described the projects. And before long, donations started to come in so that the number and range of our projects started to expand and to expand. And now at present, we have like 50 projects going. Oh, wow. In, in countries ranging from Mongolia, Cambodia, Vietnam, Sri Lanka, India, several African countries, Kenya, Malawi, Cameroon, um, Seneg Senegal, Latin America, Peru, Nicaragua, Peru, Nicaragua, Brazil, sev several in Brazil, several in Haiti, and then several projects in the United States where, there, where there's still a lot of poverty and hunger. Mm -hmm. Now, now I, I have a question, Bhante. Yeah. Uh, how do you connect with those people in those countries? Yeah. Well, the way that we work, because we don't have people like to send to those countries, and it's better to work with organizations that are based in those countries mm -hmm. themselves. So what we do is to find partner organizations that are working in the countries that know the culture, know the people, um, and know the needs. And then what they do is to apply to Buddhist Global Relief to establish a partnership. Mm. And then they sort of propose the project. And we have discussions, sometimes suggesting modifications in the project. Then we mm -hmm. form the, the partnership and then we provide the funding. And they, <clears throat> they do the work in implementing the project. And then they provide first a six month report and then at the end of the year, a fuller annual report on the project. Mm. Good. And now we have Bhante Kusala from Toronto raised his hand. Uh, maybe he has a question or maybe he has something to say. Bhante Kusala. Dharma greetings, Namami Sangang. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, Bhante Sarnapala. So, um, it's truly inspiring to hear how 
um, just a small plea to request funds, be, you know, went up to $160,000 mm -hmm. uh, funds coming. And now slowly it has become what it has become. Um, and when Rabbi Bodhi mentioned about the tsunami time, and um, I was just a newly ordained monk at that time. <laughs> and tsunami hit uh, about six months after the ordination. And I was living in coastal Sri Lanka in Madhya Virutunga Rame Temple. So the temple was in uphills, but we were just two kilometers off the coast. Mm -hmm. So we immediately became a tsunami camp with about 600 people there. Mm -hmm. Um, without any having any experience uh, with people, you know, these were mostly, um, I wouldn't say they are bad people, but they have never lived in a temple. So uh, we were learning from them and they were learning from us. So I remember, you know, sometimes when we get uh, tons of eggs and food items coming, we had to make sure that we distributed them equally among families otherwise all the discussions because uh, the attention is on uh, us three monks who are living there and the abbot also was a young monk um, so um, otherwise you know people will say we have favorism and issues like that because we needed to understand that these were people uh, who are mostly fishermen now living in uh, in in temple um, lost their houses and uh, and they were dealing with lots of emotional pain after losing people. So um, uh, we're getting lots of support, but sometimes those mattresses and stuff that came, we only had 20, but how do we distribute 20 among 600 families? We can't do that. So we, we were really struggling on our side. And on top of that, you know, on the day of tsunami, monks had to uh, drive uh, pickup trucks you know i think we had to respect the instead of respecting the letter of the law we were respecting of the law that we were kind of um, going above and beyond uh, you know understanding the need and jumping to help first thing we did was to make sure we had enough rice so um, we collected rice and uh, we started cooking all the rich and poor, everyone was living in the temple. So um, without giving any special attention to anyone, we were doing our best. And we monks ourselves were going through trauma because looking at the ocean mm -hmm. far away, because there was rumor that another wave was coming and we will be gone with that. Mm -hmm. So looking at the ocean, we felt like the smallest wave um, was going to be a tsunami wave. You know, I, I had that for a for about a year and two, until I understood how tsunamis actually occur. Like it has to happen somewhere deep in the ocean with an earthquake or something. Yeah. And then it comes um, with this huge veil. But because Venerable Bodhi mentioned about uh, hunger, um, it reminds me of this Dhammapada 203 in which it says, Jigacha Paramaruga, you know, hunger is the highest illness. You yeah. know? when uh, this is this already inspires us to really like how can we even preach dhamma when people are hungry mm -hmm. so we had to make sure people had enough food yeah. Yeah. and that's how i think uh, it all uh, felt to me and i know i have tried to ask this from venerable bodhi before in a previous discussion but it was completely unrelated at that time uh, I think you have very well articulated with uh, some at some event with Professor Hallisey at Harvard that um, your experience about seeing food in one temple and you not having adequate food at at, at least at some point going on Pindapatha and then you are seeing uh, some other temple where there was plenty of food even to waste and you was you were, <laughs> I know maybe you wouldn't want to talk about it but that's to totally fine but no, no, this that's... was this was in my early years as a monk in Sri Lanka at the temple of my teacher Venerable Balangoda Ananda Maitreya 
It was actually, at that time, Sri Lanka was going through a rather bad economic period because they, the government was, was un undertaking some experiments with the economy, which were not so successful. And so there was a lot of poverty in the country and particularly in the region where, where I was living. And my teacher, he, he wouldn't let me go on Pindapata, but he would always say, you just stay here, we'll provide food at the temple. But the food was very poor. And this was going on month after month so that my body was, I have to say, literally famished. So I could actually feel like the cells of the body crying out for nutrients. <laughs> Even to the point I was looking at my sandals and wondering whether they were edible. Literally, I'm not joking about that. But there was another monk, an Indian monk, who had come to stay at the same temple. And he was living on the other side of the hill. And we became friends. Um, and we would meet every afternoon, well, not, uh, several afternoons a, a week. We would meet to have some Dhamma discussion. And he was going Pindapata. And so one afternoon I came to visit him at his kuti and he had a banana leaf on the floor of his kuti with a heap of rice and curries on it. <laughs> and then he said to me, he asked me, he said, Venerable Bodhi, did you see the dogs today? Because <laughs> he, he would give the excess food to the dogs and believe it or not, I burst out crying. <laughs> And they said to me, what does the matter? And I told them, I'm really just famished. And then he said, you come with me and we go Pindapata together. Mm. And then he taught me how to go Pindapata because it's not customary in, Sri, in the temples of Sri Lanka at that time. And then we went Pindapata together and then problem was solved. <laughs> mm. <laughs> That's interesting. Um... Uh, I would like to uh, remind all our, our friends who are watching us on Facebook and YouTube live. Uh, if you have any uh, questions regarding today's uh, topic or uh, I, I, you're listening to some wonderful, inspiring stories of the venerable monks and nuns who are doing amazing uh, service to the humanity around the world. And uh, if you would like to uh, ask or have more clarifications, please uh, uh, make a comment, ask your questions, we will take your questions. And uh, again, a kind uh, reminder, uh, Bhante Bodhi has organized uh, two fundraisers for this uh, unique uh, uh, global Buddhist relief work. One is on uh, uh, Pacific time that is on uh, October 2nd and the Eastern time October 30th and they are going to have amazing speakers uh, and they are featuring Bhante Bodhi and uh, uh, so if you would like to uh, have more details about these two uh, great events coming up in October please uh, uh, visit uh, BuddhistGlobalRelief.org yeah. and it has all the details and uh, maybe Bhante Bodhi will be able to give more information. And uh, uh, so uh, I know Bhante uh, Jinananda from Ottawa uh, raised his hands. Uh, Bhante Jinananda, do you have anything to say? Any story or any specific questions? Uh, thank you very much, Bhante Sarnapala, for the opportunity. Yeah. It's, a, it's a great pleasure to have this uh, assembly of very nice monk and the topic today is dhamma humanity and charity as i remember yeah. so uh, thank you very much bhikkhu bodhi for unfolding uh, uh, a, a nice story about how you have been uh, you know mixing these three qualities into one and apply them with your uh, uh, i would say organization uh, to help out yeah. uh, needy people. It's empire uh, uh, very much. And when I raised my hand, uh, I wanted to appreciate that and also ask some questions. So, but I come, I will ask my question at the end of my presentation. But before that, I, uh, the very reason I raised my hand to talk about 
how I felt uh, the, the importance of Dhamma and charity and also humanity. Actually, uh, I felt that Bhante Kusala uh, somehow read my mind and I was going to talk about the tsunami time as well. Because I was at the time, I was uh, at the uh, University of Colombo second year and we are working so hard uh, to make uh, uh, everybody in the university uh, as a group to help out uh, different people in the country. Uh, it, it is um, just after the tsunami hit the country. So then um, we did not have any money at all except those bursaries and uh, scholarships that the government gave. Um, so we were thinking about what to do. Then um, uh, as a monk, I never begged money uh, for myself or anybody else. So we formed a group of monks and went to the uh, uh, busy area in Colombo called Peta, the, uh, where all the buses and people come. And our plan was to uh, go to the bus with a tin uh, to collect uh, pennies and money. And that was the first time I, I, I was talking to people openly in the bus. It was so hard for anyone to get into a bus. Of course, we have gotten into bus to go somewhere to the university, but not for this purpose. So then um, it was so hard. But one thing I remember now, which I got into my mind is that this is for people who need support. Mm. And I, I am a bhikkhu for several years now. And if I have, have done something good in my life, let me have that energy now to face this challenge in my mind and let me get into the bus and talk. Yeah, I got that energy and I got that right understanding, uh, samadhiti into my mind and compassion and other important qualities so that I never feared talking about the purpose uh, we, we are working on. So at the end, after two days, we collected uh, 176,000 uh, rupees wow. uh, and then um, gave it to uh, different camps. Of course, we went there and cooked and washed all the toilets that people uh, used to go. And we made a lot of contribution with that. And that is one of the moments that I felt that humanity, Dhamma, and all the things in us mm -hmm. as monks should come together to help out. I know that all these good monks and many monks in Sri Lanka, of course, all the monks in Sri Lanka collected different items as they can and distributed to those camps and people where stationed like Bhante Kusala. So it was the time I felt that I should uh, contribute myself to the people, in, uh, especially with need, such as food and medicine and shelter and other things, especially stationaries for students, in, in, in addition to Dhamma support. While we do support, uh, our support to people to understand the Dhamma, we should be able to be leaders of providing uh, that magnificent service to the people with all these requirements. So that is the first time I felt uh, how these Dhamma practices come together, because you should have a lot of strength as Bhikkhu Bodhi, explain and Bhante Kusala explain, there are many obstacles we face during uh, uh, this, uh, you know, organization to support people. Later on, when I move on to the U.S. Great Lake Buddhist we are in 2008, I came across how Bhikkhu Bodhi came to, uh, came to the uh, Detroit Buddhist Vihara and started the, uh, uh, that hunger walk in Kensington Park. I was there. So uh, that was the second time I myself encouraged that I should do something like this in the future. But uh, time did not uh, mm -hmm. permit me to do so. But recently, of course, three years ago, I started some projects and I have worked uh, brilliantly because the support come from different sources. And I see how Samaditi has been uh, well uh, you know, practiced in those activities. It is about uh, dealing with money, which is uh, sometimes people talk about it is not good for monks, but the very purpose is helping poor people, helping people who need medicine and all the requirements. So I managed to build a very nice, very beautiful three houses for three families during the last three years. And I worked on 
um, uh, uh, worked on uh, some other projects to help uh, uh, maybe um, nearly 5,000 families with dry food raisins and okay. also several hospitals with breathing machine and Bhante Sanupal knows uh, something about what I have been doing and I know what he has been doing also. So uh, in addition to that, we have organized a lot of all these projects. And one thing is very important to emphasize here is that genuineness in charity projects in, in those projects. If we do not have that genuine thought in mind, that generosity and compassion, we are not, to, uh, we are not being able to do that. And people put a 100% trust on us that we do the right thing with people on the ground in, and so that we have to make sure how we are going to do that. So because of that, a lot of people cry. Actually, those donors who see those houses and people who suffer from various uh, uh, you know, shortage of food and medicine, uh, people donate their whole yard and cry. That is because mm. of their love, compassion, and we could said that he cried uh, when when that happened, uh, you know, in the incident of the dog. And people cry. Isn't this beautiful? Because they belong something and they give it give it to somebody who does well. And crying, that happy crying comes out because of letting go. Isn't that samadhi is being practiced very well? So I think. Uh, uh, the, the most beautiful way as a group uh, to practice samadhi is generosity. And in that we have all the wonderful qualities. So recently I, uh, I, I started a big project to build five houses for five families and it is underway and in four months uh, it will be completed uh, according to my calculation. So people are starting supporting a lot. So if we have right intention and the plan and also good people around to organize it, I think we would be able to do a, a, a kind of, uh, you know, thought provocative service. And it is a big change of not only those people who are affecting with, with this generosity, but everybody else. So I think uh, that is wonderful. And let me Bhante share one, thing, one more thing before I go to the question I should ask from Big Bodhi. Um, a couple of months ago, I finished two houses and I showed the pictures and three people uh, came alone and said that Bante, I would like to build one, one house on my own money. So that's how five houses came into existence in my project. And uh, that, when we do things like that, they, 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 they inspire themselves mm -hmm. and support people. So in order to show this uh, genuineness, we have to show what we are doing with, without any um, selfish ideas behind it, but in order to encourage people. Now I move on to my questions for Bhikkhu Bodhi. Uh, could you please explain how Samaditi uh, is, much more, is, is, is practiced with generosity like we discussed because uh, even though we know the fact that samadhi is there theoretically, practically, the listeners would may ask questions about how we are going to practice uh, all these wonderful qualities together in social service like this from monks perspective. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Of course, if we rely on the canonical definition of samaditi, at least the what's called the lokiya samaditi, the mundane samaditi, one aspect of samaditi is recognizing that there is a benefit in practicing giving, self-sacrifice and charity, that there is the fruit and result of good deeds and of bad deeds. So that's an aspect of mundane samaditi. But I have to say in my own way of thinking, and I think the way of thinking of almost everybody involved with Buddhist Global Relief, we don't think so much that if we practice this generosity of helping others, we're going to get some good results coming to ourselves in the future. So at least in my way of thinking, I don't undertake this work with the idea of getting some kind of personal benefit through the maturation of karma. 
you know, I recognize that the law of karma holds. And certainly if we do good deeds, it's going to bring good results in the future. But maybe I would say the more important or relevant aspect of samaditi here, the way I look, look at it and think about it is that there's no essential difference between any human being throughout the planet that all people are basically have the same wishes, the same needs, the same desires, despite all of our, our, all of our apparent superficial differences. So whether it's people in Asia, people in Africa, people in Latin America, people in the United States, everybody wishes to be well, everybody has the same basic needs, the basic needs for material security, as well as for education and for the fulfillment of their wholesome aspirations. And so based on that kind of reflection, I feel that it's important for myself and for the organization to help people around the world without any discrimination on the basis that, on the understanding that all human beings are essentially alike in having the same wish to avoid suffering Mm. And I know from my own personal experience, just maybe to a little extent, what the suffering of hunger is like to my early experience in Sri Lanka. Uh, I think it, it, it is also a, like uh, Bhante Bodhi, as we recite every day, the Karanamata Sutta, Sabbe uh, Satta Bhavanta Sukitatta. So, uh, I think this is a great answer, a great question. Uh, Can thank you translate you. And, that? And wait, I, just one more other thing to, to yes, add to this. And also, if we understand like the workings of karma and rebirth, you know, we could understand that every person on this planet, at least in theory or in principle, at some point in the past, could have been our own parents mm. or our own children. So, like, if we saw our parents suffering from chronic hunger and malnutrition, we would do everything we can to provide them with food. And so if you can develop the same kind of perspective to everybody on this planet, that should motivate us to try to eliminate, to alleviate their hunger, their malnutrition, and to give them the opportunity to flourish. All right. So, um... Uh, Bhante Pemaratana from Pittsburgh raised his hand. Bhante Pemaratana, do you have a question or any story to tell us? Thank you. Thank you, Bhante, and reverential greetings to all our venerable monks and nuns. Um, I think today, you know, we talk a lot about tsunami. I think uh, many monks in Sri Lanka you know, have you know, a lot of experience with, uh, with tsunami, and, and it, although it's unfortunate event, uh, somehow it help so many us to bring uh, so many, you know, uh, bring our humanity out, bring our goodness out. And, and so many months in Sri Lanka, you know, uh, committed so much to help those uh, affected people. And it was so, uh, today I, I learned that, you know, our, our Bhikkhu Bodhis in this uh, global Buddhist relief is also born as a result of seeing the suffering of, you know, the tsunami affected people and also seeing the lack of uh, Buddhist organization. So it was, it was, so uh, it was uh, nice to see, uh, hear that, you know, even though it was a negative, a bad, yeah. unfortunate event, you know, somehow it has given rise to so many good things. And yeah. I'd like to share a very small experience that, you know, I was also in Sri Lanka uh, when the tsunami happened. And uh, as uh, Bhante Kusala and Bhante Janana mentioned, and, uh, and we were also helping people. About, but I was not from a coastal area and I'm from Kuru Nagala district. I'm from Kulia Piti. But many people in our area brought so many uh, dry food and even some sometimes cooked food uh, to those affected uh, areas. So when we travel to down south and to, to bring those food and uh, necessary items, and we noticed that actually in those camps, uh, we found some children who lost their parents. <laughs> Uh, and then my master <laughs> decided that, you know, I mean, we can give this food and this temple really, but what's going to happen to these children? Yeah. So my master came back and, you know, convened our, you know, daikas, our devotees, and, and he suggested that we, will, we should start a children's home. 
and I open it. So, so because of that, and so we, you know, so someone uh, volunteered to give, uh, give, her, give his house as a rent. So somehow we in, initially we started and we brought uh, uh, 11 boys from uh, Tangal <laughs> and we started uh, an open age. I mean, we had no plans to have an open age, you know, other than simple, but we, due to the needs of that time. So we started an open age. And we, you know, we uh, helped those uh, 11 boys. And later, of course, there were other boys also. And it was not limited to tsunami affected families later. And we helped them to, you know, study. And, you know, uh, they, and we took care of them until they became young adults. And um, I'm still in touch with some of the boys. And now they're actually adults. And uh, it was such a you know, nice experience. But, but then we also started uh, Open Edge for girls also. Uh, so mm -hmm. now in our temple in Kulia Pitya, we have uh, 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 the children home for boys and children home for girls. I think Bhante uh, uh, Surya Ratana has visited our temple. Mm. Uh, so that those two open ages, two children, we call the open age, uh, children homes were also a result of the tsunami and we took care of uh, so many girls now actually. They are not related to tsunami, but you know, there are so many other reasons yeah, yeah. they become helpless. So we uh, took care, take care of them. So it was an, again another small nice thing that came up from tsunami. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Bhante, you know, I have a small question for our venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi. Uh, I think I, I saw the, the uh, hunger, having hunger, uh, like uh, feeding, feed the hungry program. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, uh, so this, as, as we discussed actually, this is the very basic, most basic human yeah. need to yeah. fulfill. Um, but I would like to know, Bante, other than simply providing food, you know, um, uh, do you envision or think or, uh, that we can, can we help uh, those people it will kind of, you know, find some way to cultivate their food? You know, because sometimes providing oh. this food no, is a temporary relief, you know. Yeah. Do you have yeah. any programs that help them to grow and maybe cultivate? I mean, definitely, definitely. In fact, when we started, we thought that the main way to help address the problem of hunger and malnutrition is through direct food aid. That was the very beginning. But then we started to inquire, like, what are the underlying roots of hunger and malnutrition? Mainly the underlying root is poverty. And so then the question is, how do we help people emerge from poverty? And two big underlying roots of poverty we found is the subordinate status of girls and women in many traditional cultures. And so in order to help people overcome poverty, two of the most effective ways, one is to promote the education of girls, mm -hmm. of poor children, but especially girls. And so a lot of our projects are not involved with direct food aid at all, but rather with the education of girls. And to give you like one example of a project like this, we've had since 2009, we partnered with another US-based organization that's working in Cambodia. It's called, Lo the organization is called Lotus Outreach International. And they started a program in Cambodia called, they call it GATE which stands for Girls Access to Education. And the way this project works is that we sponsor food donations to the families of these girls who are becoming teen, reaching their teenage years. Because what happens usually in Cambodia when the girl reaches the teenage years, the family will force her to drop out of school to start working. So we provide food to the family on condition that they allow the girls to stay in school. And as a result of that, hundreds of girls were able to complete their high school education. But beyond that, Lotus Outreach started a second phase project called Catalyst, which sponsors girls to continue into university education. And now we're sponsoring, I think it's about 16, maybe it's actually 20, I think it's closer to 30 girls from the poorest strata of society in Cambodia who have completed their high school education and now they're studying in universities. 
Yeah, so that's one kind of project supporting the education, one type of project supporting the education of girls. Another project or type of project is supporting women with right livelihood projects in order to earn to support their families. So an example of this, we have a project in India with a partner organization is called Building Bridges. And what happened in India because of the dominance of the corporate industrial agricultural system, many farmers become dependent upon chemical inputs and so on. They run up big debts, they can't pay their debt, they commit suicide and they leave behind their wife and children. So the project that we have with Building Bridges India trains women on one side, it trains women in cultivating medicinal crops, that is herbs that are used in Indian Ayurvedic medicine. And another project trains women widows of farmers who have committed suicide in, this is called as textiles, in, in preparing clothing, textiles. Yeah. yeah, and but we also have a lot of projects that support poor farmers to uh, develop and apply ecologically sustainable systems of agriculture. Yeah, yeah my okay. phone is ringing, but I'm going okay. to let it ring. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Bhante, for sharing those, you know, wonderful projects. You know, I think, I think the last point you mentioned that helping farmers to, you know, um, like educating farmers to grow and cultivate. As Bhante yeah. mentioned, I think, after uh, introduction of this market economy, you know, we are, you know, all the big industries and agriculture companies overtaking the local farmers. Exactly, exactly, yeah. And even, even the villages themselves, rather than cultivating and growing their, you know, whatever their necessary things, they, they have also been trained, you know, conditioned to go and buy things from, from the possible market. They are expensive. So then yeah. they spend money. So I don't know, maybe we can, it will be a very fruitful program if we can, uh, like it, like have an education and also some support program from local farmers, uh, because sometimes you know, the, what we grow locally can be more nutritious than exactly, in exactly, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, these are these are wonderful stories. You know, uh, I'm I'm pretty sure when tsunami uh, was happening, uh, I'm pretty sure Bante Upratana was here in the states. And I was here in Toronto, Canada, and I, I know what we have done actually during that time. Uh, our local temples actually uh, raised a lot of money. I can tell the story later, but uh, Bhante Uparatana, you were here. I know you were doing a lot of things uh, during that time. Uh, would you like to share your story, Bhante Uparatana? Yes, there is a um, tsunami uh, incidents happen living in the Washington area, many uh, international group living around here, and they were sympathy about what happened to Sri Lanka. And at uh, that time, actually uh, a lot of uh, material plus and uh, money, I, uh, our temple, our devotees together, we collected and uh, huge three trucks loaded the things sent to the Sri Lanka and uh, uh, one truck, we get the chance to however relief. Others are they're charging money and we didn't have the enough money to kind of political situation in Sri Lanka. We had the hard time to relief from the uh, get from the government permission to the uh, distribute the people. However, uh, we make almost hundred thousand mm dollars -hmm. and then and uh, the just for the few days, then uh, in the uh, uh, affected area in, uh, in uh, Hambantota, we built up uh, uh, around 30 houses plus one temple. And uh, we distributed the uh, uh, Muslim and Sinhalese uh, mm -hmm. community. And uh, that is a wonderful thing, even though time to time I go there and uh, uh, visiting them and giving some, um, uh, some helping for them. And it's a wonderful thing we done. It's very great. And uh, but uh, as Venerable 
uh, Bodhi mentioned about education things, uh, also we are indirectly supporting various area in Sri Lanka, but uh, we don't have exact proper uh, uh, program in order to support him for them. And uh, that is my uh, uh, dream to help for everybody, North and East, and uh, uh, especially their lack of uh, facilities over there. I want to help them. And one day I will, but uh, uh, in tsunami time, I'm so glad Washingtonian helped mm. not for the Sri Lankan uh, mm. community. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Bantu Bharatana, for sharing your uh, experience and telling the story how you and your temple, your devotees, helped uh, the people in Sri Lanka during that time. Um, if, okay, so uh, I know. Uh, Either Bante uh, Dhammo or Bhikkhu uh, Yutu Dhammo, raise their hand. But before, hold, hold your thought, okay? Hold your question. And in, in YouTube, uh, there's a question. I see Bante Bodhi was talking about the two roots of the poverty. And uh, someone uh, is asking, uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi, uh, I didn't catch the second root of poverty. Oh, actually, what I, I mean is, I should say, the subordinate status, well, let's say the lack of educational opportunities for girls and the subordinate status of women. So they're, they're related. But to counter each of these, one needs a different strategy. For the girls, one has to provide them with the opportunity to get education. And for the women who are particularly, who are left without resources to maintain their families, to provide them with opportunities to start right livelihood projects okay. through some kind of vocational training. Mm. Yeah, wonderful. Um, I know dear friends, uh, those who are watching us on YouTube and Facebook live, uh, feel free to ask questions. I know I see some questions in the YouTube uh, channel. I will take your questions, but before that, we have our venerable monks and nuns. They, uh, uh, they would like to tell their story. They would like to ask uh, questions from each other. And uh, so my priority is going to the monks and nuns at the moment, but uh, I'm not discouraging you that just, you know, may, uh, com make a comment with your question. I will take your question. So Bhante uh, uh, Dhammo uh, from Hamilton, Canada, uh, you raised your hand. Do you have a story to tell or ask your questions? I've got lots of stories. Uh, thank you, Bhante Sanapala. And so my respect to all is our venerable monks and nuns also as well. Yeah. So my name is Damo, actually. We uh, actually, I have uh, been through uh, many uh, situations because I am a Rapuji monk. I used to stay and live in uh, Rapuji almost since uh, six years in uh, Thai Cambodian border. We have uh, during the war time, so they escaped from far away. Uh, usually, I rest and uh, were born in uh, southern of Vietnam, but I'm in Cambodia. Uh, normally, I uh, live in uh, Thailand, perhaps enough to witness and experience uh, the poor, uh, the war, and uh, the difficulties, and many, many obstacles. And got to know because it's uh, so many things that happened during the war time actually because of Vietnam war also as well. But uh, in reality, when I also been in uh, Rapuji camp, I saw many things um, happen also in uh, Thai uh, Cambodian border. Mm -hmm. But the thing that I um, uh, really inspired during the Mahakos Ananda, who are also mm -hmm. still uh, being alive, perhaps. Uh, when the ball is a pickle party, he got to know him. He's a Mahako Sananda. He one who uh, can be said that very uh, in my mind. He's a one of my uh, icon in uh, in practice, also in uh, humanitarian effort, also as well. He was uh, you. You were the, the you looked after Mahako Sananda for a while as a novice, no? Uh, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Also, no. I'm when uh, I still I, I'm a monk also as well. I'm a monk already, but. Uh, I uh, like to practice, and either also 1989, uh, 1990, also I joined his um, uh, Tamayatra mm -hmm. in 
Cambodian not only for first time but also uh, second times. Mm. And we went to the mine and killing. They would, they would mm. walk through the minefields, walk mm. through the battlefields. So his... It is the first time, so been there, and second time we were uh, uh, some other monk were killed by uh, landmines. Mm. That is, I saw in my, you know, it's a friend of mine. I saw with the nun and with the lay uh, people also. But anyway, perhaps it's a long story to tell and to let this uh, Ponte know uh, just a little bit. But um, uh, the current that I uh, just want to emphasize and um, let is uh, Ponte know that is uh, actually I um, have with, um, we know that the pandemic is uh, create a lot of yeah. anxiety and uh, stress and um, uh, people also not only in a particular area, but also uh, in around the world. But it's now that I um, uh, just uh, being also um, uh, organized only a small uh, effort in order to help uh, those who are un un unfortunate uh, have enough food to eat and also with the medication. Uh, those area I um, help out as is in Vietnam and also include Cambodian because we have our people back home. Uh, they are work uh, uh, moving from their local, uh, uh, their province to another province. And also during the pandemic, the, the government just uh, locked down and they have no food, they have no uh, medication. Yeah. So, by, so far, I uh, collect is uh, almost around uh, over $6,000 uh, mm -hmm. to help those who are in need. It also each family. Uh, they can uh, receive is uh, $15, only $15, so they can survive during the pandemic because they have no work and um, most of them they live in um, in um, in a factory area and they suffer so much, include this um, uh, uh, situation because of some of uh, most of them they are over two months right now no work at all the government has shut down the countries in southeast asia it's something many of you might not be aware of but uh vietnam cambodia the monks can't leave the monastery the lay people can't come to the monastery they can't go on alms round so uh, not just the monks of course but it's something that we're hearing about mm -hmm. now yeah. yes it is because of during uh, uh, ancestor uh, festival, especially during the um, uh, Wasa Ren retreat. So the government not allow local people to go to uh, a temple and either also not allow monk to go uh, collect the food outside. So that's why they are facing with, uh, I believe it's a lot of things happening at the mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. So this is only a short uh, story. I just would like to uh, let because it's a, yes, everybody know about the situation right now at the moment in uh, those mm -hmm. country. And thank you again, Mr. Ponte. And hope yeah. you know. how how do how are the monks getting their food and in the monasteries? Uh, actually, right now, Mr. Ponte, they I think uh, some of them they just is um, either also in the main gate. The government somehow they uh, uh, prepare not only prepare they also uh, all the uh, security to to block it. And uh, perhaps I know is uh, some of like local people they have a very generous mm -hmm. in order to provide by just a sneaking also in the temple. Perhaps they have a connection and them, some of them also just go by not only directly, they know how to provide. And um, that's why some, some of the local temple also really hungry at the moment. So one, one thing to understand is uh, Bande Dammo is uh, Cambodian, but the part of Cambodia where he lives was given to Vietnam by the French yeah, years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah. And so they're a diaspora and the government of Vietnam isn't all that supportive of yeah. their culture. Yeah. And their culture. Hmm. yeah, I know uh, uh, Bante uh, Damo uh, does help a lot of people in Cambodia and also in Vietnam. Uh, because uh, I see what he's doing. So uh, uh, thank you, Bante Damo, for doing such a great service uh, uh, to the people, especially the, the, in the people in the poorest regions in Cambodia. And um, so, okay, uh, does anyone have any other questions 
Uh, okay, uh, Bhante Jinananda, you raised uh, your hand. Uh, I will give you the chance to answer questions. And also I would like to uh, take some questions from the audience. Uh, they have asked some questions from Bhante Bodhi. I think these are very interesting questions. Uh, Bhante Jinananda. Uh, <clears throat> Bhante, uh, thank you once again. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to share uh, a wonderful activities uh, done by two monks recently. Uh, they are not here though. Uh, one is uh, Bhante Dhammavasa from the uh, Vihara, we have one river, uh, Sarnapal and Bhante Kusala lives. And the other Bhante is from Malaysia, Bhante Sarnankara. They are very interesting individuals who never come with Dhamma sermons and, and also programs uh, like many monks do, but they are humanity, charity, uh, you know, manifested a lot about the Dhamma that the Buddha asks us to practice. But I will start with uh, Bhante Dhammas from Toronto. This is a very remarkable thing and we should ap appreciate it. He's a, he's a sort of monk who helps each and everyone, no matter where people come from. Um, whatever he receives, like Bhante Sarnapal and other monks at the Bihar, gives um, to any person who, whom requested. And any person who come to Toronto airport from Sri Lanka, especially, he would give uh, food and uh, other re requirements uh, for, the, for, the, for, the, for their settlement in addition to what he has been doing in Sri Lanka. And I, I, I came to know this from uh, the, this particular thing this uh, great monk does uh, two years ago when I involved with some, some activities to help him. And what the Sanapala, I think, knows more than I do. And uh, it is a great thing. And nobody knows about it. And I insisted him to tell what you do, Bhante, to people, just to encourage people about samaditi, to practice samaditi and generosity, kindness. Because a lot of people like to practice the Noble Eightfold Path, not as monks under trees and, and other places where Buddha prescribed, but with activities. So that uh, people find easy to practice those wonderful qualities. So uh, Bante Damawasa uh, has been such a great monk who helped many people in Canada, especially Sri Lankans, and also many needy people in Sri Lanka, including monks. Now I go to Bante Sarnankar because I have been closely associating him for, for several years. Uh, la during last three months, he helped uh, over hundred uh, monastic colleges called Pirivana with all the, uh, you know, food items uh, for young monks and uh, elderly monks and also people around in the temple, including uh, lay people. Uh, I came to know this some time ago and they organized it well and it's huge, uh, tons of uh, dry food so that uh, they have helped a lot of temples. So, but people do not know about them. Monks in this group, as well as who are not here, help not only Sri Lankans, but elsewhere, like Bante Dhammo mentioned, uh, with all these material things, just to take people out of suffering. And Buddha has given us these uh, provisions uh, from his uh, normal behavior that one day he asked uh, asked to give food for, for a hung, hung, uh, you know, hungry persons before he tell the Dhamma. And Venerable Sariputta, in his, uh, uh, you know, Dhamma Senapati character, he has proved that people, monks and lay people should have uh, basic requirements to practice the Dhamma. In essence, if you want to practice all Samaditi and other qualities, uh, Bhante, we have to have this uh, humanity, generosity, kindness, compassion together in activity so that people feel that a sense of the higher Dhamma, I think in my experience, I find very easy to meditate when I feel that I help somebody with anything I can do. So that's what I wanted to share with you, Bhante. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, of course, there are so many stories, uh, wonderful, inspiring stories that we can uh, tell. And of course, uh, all these uh, respected uh, monks and nuns, uh, they are doing an amazing job um, so uh, I would like to uh, 
uh, take some questions from the audience. But before that, uh, dear friends, I have posted the website link of the Global Buddhist Relief website to yeah. in Facebook and YouTube. And please uh, uh, don't click right now. Maybe you can click onto these links later. Otherwise, you're going to miss all these stories. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so um, here's a question. Um, uh, where were Bhikkhu Bodhi? This is a question from oh, you. Uh, they, they are asking, this is a question from the Dharmadharani Monastery. The relationship between the empowerment of women and girls and re reversing climate change as published in the book uh, draw down. Oh, that's a very interesting point. Yeah. Um, I don't remember the details because this was something that I had come across maybe about two years ago. But there was probably it's a book, but it was also a website called Drawdown. I think it was developed by. Oh, now the name slips my mind. Anyway, he's what one of the main sort of formulators of solutions to climate change. And he had listed a number of measures that contribute to the reduction of carbon emissions and thereby to the um, reversal of climate change. And I think in the sixth position of the list, he had the education of girls. Again, it's not fresh in my mind, so I don't remember the connection that he drew between the education of girls and how it contributes to reducing carbon emissions, but he did. I think the person who asked the question probably has it fresher in her mind than it is in my mind right now, but it yeah. was mentioned as I think the sixth most effective antidote to climate change is educating girls. Uh yeah, I see this is a question came from Dhammada Arini Monastery. I know uh, uh, Venerable Sobana was here. Uh, Aya Sobana. Uh, she's gone. Anyway, so I asked the question. Oh, yeah. Uh, is that yeah, she is there, yeah. Venerable Sobana? Yes. Yeah. Do, do, you, do you have any further questions about the question? Uh, my main... Um observation about uh, courage and generosity these days is that uh, there's a both a material change happening with climate change and a cultural change happening in USA so that a lot of our Buddhist friends are under a great deal of stress every day. Uh, those who are working in helping professions are working in any profession uh, going out to try to do their work and just being confronted with levels of hatred that we've never seen before in recent times. Mm -hmm. So um, the courage that I see as being, the generosity that I see as being needed is not even so much um, like material support mm -hmm. as giving a kind of like a, a moral support uh, for people to be able to carry on and to uphold their Buddhist values in their day-to-day -day life, uh, doing the, the wholesome work that they're already set out to do. This is, is just uh, how I, my experience of it. Um, I don't have a, a direct experience or to comment about the uh, wonderful uh, charitable projects that have been uh, developed and organized. Yeah, thank you, uh, thank you. And I, uh, I'm, I would like to take a question from the audience from you, YouTube channel. Uh, this uh, uh, friend named Julie, Julie is asking a question. I'm wondering how in the West we can educate lay people to be more supportive of Buddhist monks. Um, we need to be supportive of monks needs to help them continue to do the wonderful work you do. <laughs> so maybe uh, Bante Bodhi, you can. <laughs> In a way, I don't face that challenge so much yes. since this, the monastery where I live, I have to say it's well supported so that I don't have that challenge as a day to day basis. But maybe some of the other monks can answer that question more. Mantis, yeah. Mantis, Anupala, 
yeah. can I make a suggestion? Because yeah. uh, we we came to know about uh, different monks, different very programs which are very beautiful. But even now, we come to know about them because of this discussion. So how how about if we uh, maintain a website uh, and uh, publish all these good activities? especially monks do in the North America, or maybe in the US and Canada, of course, North America, so that people come to know about monks do, not only guiding people into meditation and daily practices, but they have been taking care of various number of people from various countries, uh, just to boost their social, cultural, and all the other aspect of life. Yeah, isn't that, a, I, I, because it's a suggestion that nobody knows that, that which monk does, uh, you know, which program, and in only today, uh, I think many people come to know about both is very nice program. So how about if we have a website or a page where each monk, uh, you know, send uh, their charity work and here work on humanity so that people come to know about. It's only a suggestion. Yeah. Yeah, I see, I see that's a great idea. Maybe we can form a, a maybe not another organization, North American Sangha Council, something like that. <laughs> and so uh, in Canada, in USA, all the temples can come together and we can list their websites and uh, the activities they are doing so that uh, people around the world could uh, visit the website and uh, support each other. I think that's the that's the only way to do it. Um, so uh, Bante, you may have to find a volunteer Bhante, who can help us to maintain such a website. Yeah, you can send out to you know to your friends. I think you have the largest number of followers and friends. <laughs> <laughs> so I, you I, can I, ask for volunteers who can come and help. You know, these yeah. things comes to you know uh, uh, publicize what they are doing. Yeah, I think I think uh, Bante Pemberton, we could do it. I think that uh, we are doing this conversation today is because of the kind of request I received from our beloved uh, Bante Bodhi, uh, who is organizing this uh, fundraisers uh, in October. And so I thought, you know, to have an open discussion about the Dharma, humanity, and charity, so that this would give more motivation, inspiration to the public to support uh, and to, and of course now. Of course, all of you are doing an amazing job. People did not know. And now people are saying something like, you know, they are inspired, they are motivated, they want to help. And I think th this is the whole purpose. So we have three hands raised. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, we don't have much time. We have only 10 more minutes. It was Bante Sunita who raised the hand first. Bante Sunita, two minutes maybe. <laughs> or maybe three minutes. <laughs> Yes, uh, there is a discrimination of criticism, like, uh, you know, I think there's something wrong with you, like, you can, you can fix it, we... Yeah, now, now you can hear, yeah, right? No, there's a music in the background. Of course. Let me give the opportunity to Ante Panyu from Washington. Right. Okay, now you okay? Yeah. Okay, good. Now, now good to go. <laughs> I want to say actually, there is a, a criticism like uh, though venerable monks uh, preach about the giving, but uh, they don't practice giving. Like, mm -hmm. I cannot remember the full stanza, but <laughs> that uh, actually, yes. Uh, thank you very much for uh, coming forward and letting people know what the venerable monks uh, and nuns do uh, doing. Mm -hmm terms of practicing uh, generosity. And also, we all uh, practice generosity. That is the part of our and uh, part of our practice. And uh, the, we, cannot uh, we cannot forget the uh, compassion and metta, the uh, base of our practice uh, of uh, our higher spiritual gain. So, and uh, I also a few, uh, two years ago, almost two years ago, initiate a project to build a water project uh, in my village uh, temple, at my village temple, because it's a very rural area in uh, Ju June, July, August. Uh, in this e uh, period, we cannot find water. It's very difficult, also drinking water. 
So what I did is uh, was I I uh, I made a small Buddha statue uh, with uh, out of uh, small mold. So I could sell uh, almost uh, maybe uh, thirty or fifty uh, statue, and I collected around uh, five hundred thousand Sri Lankan rupees. So here people uh, buy, and also Bhante Sarnapala also support for me, and Bhante Naika um, Hamdur uh, also support for me buying and introducing my project. And I could uh, finish that program. Actually, now uh, the people and venerable monks and also villagers, they drink their, uh, they get their drinking water. So I'm very happy. Mm -hmm. So also the, the suggestion uh, from Bhante Jinananda is very great. So we, then we can, uh, you know, uh, give uh, the idea that not only venerable monks preaching the Dhamma to, uh, mm -hmm but they are practicing really. So uh, creating a website uh, is a great uh, you know, method. We can show what the venerable monks do. Yeah, amazing. I know uh, Bhante Sunita actually was doing amazing to help people. He had this special project, uh, making uh, Buddha statues. And of course, those who ask for Buddha statues and they buy them from him and those money the funds went to that project. It actually it was amazingly done. I'm so inspired. So thank you. And uh, Bante Varapanyo from Washington, DC. Uh, you raised your hand and maybe you have something to share. Uh, you, please unmute yourself and speak up. Uh, maybe a few things I can share, but I really just wanted to uh, express my gratefulness to all the venerable monks here, especially Bante Bodhi. And, um, to, to answer the question that came up about how to uh, encourage people to be more supportive of monks in the West. And I think it really comes down to relationships. And uh, for a Sri Lankan monk or for most monks in the West, they're from Asia, they're not from Western country. And so even though they live in the West, even though they live in North America, most of their relationships and support are through the not only the, the devotees, the Sri Lankan people or the Thai people, but also the other monks, the relationships with other temples. And uh, of course, most of the people in the West are Western people. And to support them or to encourage them to support Western temples, uh, I think they need to have a, a kind of access point for having a relationship with that temple. And I think one of the best ways that we can establish that and support that is by having a deeper relationship with North American monks or Western monks, or, you know, if you are in North America, you, you're a Western monk in some way. So I really like what you said, Bhante uh, Saranapala, about the North American uh, monastic organization. I, I think it's really important to have something like that. And I also find that when it comes to uh, generosity, it's all about connections and relationships. And it's one thing to kind of just give money to an organization and, you know, hope that it does good. And it's an entirely different thing when you have very direct relationships with people on the ground and you know that that money is going directly to people who need it. And it's both more effective for the person receiving it and it's also more effective for the person giving it and uh, i think that as a monastics we're really in a position to to support that happening in a in a big scale yeah thank you uh, thank you Bante Varapanyo. Uh, uh, actually uh, you know one of the key objectives of this bi-weekly sutta discussion uh, with all the monks and nuns is, is to do the networking, you know, to get to know the monks and nuns and, and what they are doing. And, and because we need to bring uh, Dhamma to the forefront to give the motivation, inspiration to the public. You know, otherwise people are thinking like, you know, oh my goodness, these monks are just there uh, accepting the food and dana from others, from the lay people, they're doing nothing. In, in fact, and we know what we all are doing. So. So that's the main reason, you know, we are coming together like this to talk about, to discuss the Dhamma and to tell each other's stories. 
And uh, so uh, I have more questions, but uh, Bante Kusala asked, can you ask the question now? Bante, so uh, just a comment here. Yeah. Um, especially, um, I'm grateful to Bhikkhu Bodhi um, uh, because when I contemplated on uh, starting projects and helping at different times, especially when uh, flooding came in Sri Lanka, uh, post tsunami work and um, uh, building houses. So um, I looked at Venerable Bodhi and I thought if he's doing it, it's totally um, fine for me to start projects like that. Now, why mm -hmm. I say that is because we are all in Theravada tradition and sometimes people would think that monks are not supposed to be handling these huge projects. They should be only focused on their spiritual practice. But I have gained so much um, wisdom, a um, lot of um, encouragement, and I've seen lots of joy um, happening around these projects and lives being transformed. Um, so that's really amazing. And I am grateful to Venerable Bodhi for his huge project, which goes with, you know, and I think he one time mentioned when he wanted to help Sri Lanka, he looked at the websites and most temples do work, but they don't have websites. So it's really hard to reach out to individual temples. So um, I think I'll stop there without taking much time that it's always great to have information out so people know what we are doing. Yeah. Um, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Bhante Kusala, uh, Bhante Bodhi. Yeah, I just wanted to say people are commending me for the work of Buddhist Global Relief, but I have to say that in a way, <laughs> I'm the lazy man on the team. <laughs> <laughs> We have a very excellent team. I think it's about four or five lay people who work very hard, particularly our executive director, who's originally from Vietnam, um, but she's lived in the US since 1973. She is like the real live wire of Buddhist Global Relief, who's just developed the organization from its initial, just from a seed into the organization it is today. So I have to give the credit to them. Yeah, thank you, Bante. And uh, I know, uh, Verbal, uh, you the Dhamma, you raise your hand, but you're so dark, we can't see you. There's no light. Can I just one minute or even less than yeah, minute? one minute, please? I just wanted to say thank you and, and, and bring attention to one of the great things that comes from these sessions, and especially this session, is not just all the great work that we're hearing about, but the fact that we're hearing about it. And one of the great things that monks can do is provide the Dhamma. Remember, the greatest gift is the gift of Dhamma. And reminding all of us of the unique position, I think, that monks are in to, to provide the direction for such organizations, which Bhikkhu Bodhi, as humble as he is, most definitely is doing. Uh, if it weren't for him, there, would be, there wouldn't be those people doing all that great work. And a lot of us would be hampered if Bhikkhu Bodhi hadn't provided us and, and monks like Bhikkhu Nyanamoli and monks who have provided us with the Dhamma mm. remind, reminds us of the importance of generosity, reminds us of the importance of self-sacrifice and letting go of your own wants and being in a position where you are able, perfectly able to help others. And a reminder that all the monks, you don't have to feel bad if you're, if you're only giving a little bit or if you're only directing and if you're only teaching because teaching is so important. Anyway, that's it. Yeah. Dhamma Danang Jinati. Thank you all for the Dhamma, especially today. It's so great to hear. Sad. Yeah, thank you, Venerable Yutta Dhamma. And uh, I know there's a, a friend in YouTube who has finally is sad to hear about the monk situation in Cambodia. How can we help uh, from Canada? So I think that you could uh, contact the Venerable Dhamma at the Wat Kama Hamilton. The, in, you, can, if, you can get his contact number from me. So uh, this coming to an end, so I would like to just say a few words from my end, uh, and I'm so inspired of all the stories, and I'm very delighted to tell all of you, uh, and of course our temple uh, has been in the forefront helping the people, in, uh, in our uh, Chief Abbot Bhante Damawasa and uh, Bhante Mudita, we were helping a lot of people, not only here and also in other countries, especially for me, 
since mid 90s till today, uh, we have been helping the people on the streets, uh, Bante Bodhi. Uh, we have a special program called the soup kitchen and also sharing scaring program. We walk on the streets uh, with care packages. We distribute the care packages to the homeless people. We have been doing this uh, since mid 90s till this time. And also we raise funds. And even during this difficult time, uh, we uh, local temples raised uh, funds for the local food banks. You know, we, I'm very happy to uh, make an, this announcement we raised uh, close to $16,000 mm -hmm. and we distributed those money to the local food banks here in Toronto, Mississauga and, and Markham. And also from, from my side, you know, I have been uh, doing this to educate the young people. You know, we have a Buddhist youth council and, and we are teaching Dhamma, the compassion, kindness in action, how to practice generosity, how to take care of the people. Uh, and uh, so we, uh, we were able to build several generations of young kids with this kind of practices here in Toronto. And uh, from me, you know, probably you have seen my activities in the social media, how during this difficult time, how I was helping, sending help to the people around the world, people in India, Nepal, Bangladesh, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, uh, Uganda, Congo, the latest one was the Congo, you know, I, I, I think you have seen the pictures and the video, you know, seeing the, that situation, our heart is, you know, begins to throb and, and melts down, this, you know, this is unfair. So as Buddhist monks, we are trying our best to help people. And also, for, as Bhante Bodhi said, education is, uh, it should be the number one main cause to uplift to motivate the young people to, to reduce, to get rid of the uh, poverty. Mm -hmm. And because of that in Bangladesh, uh, at the moment I'm helping uh, 60 kids, boys and girls from the poorest families. Mm -hmm. And I knew that, you know, uh, if they get one education, one person, one student can liberate his or her own family. Mm -hmm. So these things are going on. These are, there are so many stories to tell, but we have run out of the time. <laughs> So I'm very grateful, very thankful to all of you. And once again, dear friends, uh, uh, our Dhamma colleague, uh, please uh, share this, uh, uh, you know, the website, the, web, uh, the link in your own social media timeline to support Bhante Bodhi's uh, global relief uh, effort. Uh, the fundraiser is taking place in October. Yeah, October 2nd and October. is for the West Coast and the Mountain States. Then October 30th is supposed to be for the Eastern, Southern and Midwestern states. But in Canada, you could join either one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, Bante, for sure, we will definitely. <laughs> so, uh, and I know that there were some questions regarding the Bikuni Sasana, how about establishing the Bikuni orders? <laughs> and I, I did not address that, but I just want to inform uh, our friends, we are not taking sides. Even someone said, you know, we are addressing all of the monks, but I definitely said monks and nuns, you know, so many times, maybe you did not pay attention to it. We, we are not discriminating. We have included all the venerable monks and nuns here. And I always encourage, the, of course, we also have few bikunis here who, who are in this discussion, uh, but they have their webcam off. <laughs> so we, we, we might have another discussion on the bikuni order. Uh, so now let us conclude our discussion. I would like to invite Bhante Sunita to recite the Patimokkha Desana verses. You have to unmute yourself. <clears throat> Again, Venerable uh, Bhante Sarnapala, and also uh, I would like to bring my uh, wishes uh, for especially uh, Venerable Bikubodi for being here with us and wishing you long healthy life to <laughs> practice being a, a great example for us and also all the all the other venerable monks i wish i wish you all uh, good health and happiness and also peace let me uh, recite the uh, stanzas <clears throat> Sab pa pas akar nang 
कुशलात्स उप सचित पारियो दप नंग बुद्धान सासन खांति पर मंग तपोतिबर मंग वदंति बुद्ध नही पब जितो परूप घाती तमनो होति परंग विहेठयं तो अनूप वादु अनूप घातु पाति मोखे च संवरु मतंग च बतस्मिन अंत च शयनासन अधिचिते च आयोगो एतंग बुद्धान सासन साधु 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 Amazing, amazing. That was a beautiful chanting done by yeah, Bhante Pulita. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. that beautiful yeah. meditation. And that took us back to Buddha's time, as if we are <laughs> hearing the words of the Buddha now. <laughs> so uh, I'm very happy and very grateful to all of you. And uh, thank you, Bhante Bodhi, for uh, sacrificing you. your uh, time today to join this discussion. and. Uh, your presence in our discussion gives us such a huge inspiration, motivation, Bhante. And I had to tell you this. And all the venerable monks and nuns who are here, they greatly appreciate you. And your presence gives us the courage to continue this kind of work. Okay, thank you. And we would like you to live. Oh, maybe this is our selfish purpose, <laughs> to make you live long for our own benefit. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, we will benefit from this. So may you have all the blessings and well, may all blessings of the Buddha, Dhamma, and the Sangha continue to be with all of you, venerable monks and nuns, and our uh, friends who are watching us on uh, Facebook and YouTube. Uh, may you all live long uh, with good health and may all blessings be with you and may all sentient beings be well, happy, and peaceful. Good night from Canada. Okay. Okay. You. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.